What's going on? It's your man, Kobe. Welcome to another episode of Digital Dash, where I'll be giving you guys tips on how to market your songs and get those numbers booming. Now, today, I have a very special guest with me, my girl, Portia Marie. How are you doing? Hi, guys. I'm doing great. And as y'all can see, this, this, this is a little bit more of a podcast-style interview. I only had one lavalier mic, and I didn't feel like buying another one before this interview, so I was like, I got these two podcast mics. We'll make it work. So, you know, um... Yeah, man, but Portia is a friend of mine, a colleague, someone that I work out here, uh, work with out here in Atlanta a lot. Um, she's very invested in the scene out here and probably one of the, if not the hardest working woman I know. So, oh, I don't know <laughs> um, so yeah, so I guess just before we really start to just dive into exactly what you do, I guess give them a backstory on, you know, how did you exactly get into the industry? How did you get to the space that you are now? Give them your, give them your, your backstory. Okay, guys, I'm going to try to give you a long story short. I am Portia Marie. I came to Atlanta September 17, 2014. And upon my arrival, I just knew, like, I didn't have no job. I had nowhere to live. Luckily, on the way, my humble was like, I got a couch or really a futon you could sleep on and a couch to put your clothes in. I said, bet. So then I got here and I just figured it out. And so it really started with me interning. Well, before the internship, I started my own brand called The PM Effect. The PM Effect was a sports and entertainment outlet where I did like celebrity interviews. I did online like blogging and things of that nature. And then it turned into me um, starting to intern at Radio One, which is now Urban One. I started interning and I started to come into the back scene of radio. And I realized that I actually kind of like being behind the scenes, um, making the plays, understanding logistics and things of that nature. And from there, Still at the same time, I was still building my brand. I was still doing my red carpet interviews, my celebrity one-on-ones and things of that nature. And just so happened um, the following summer, um, I'm, sh I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Ears. He signed yeah. to Ear Drummers. But Ears, um, this was Birthday Bash. If you're familiar with Birthday Bash, it's one of the hottest concerts hosted here in Atlanta every summer by Radio 1 or Urban 1 now. And... It was at the block party. Ears got up on the speakers. He just went, wow. The dude went crazy. What year was this? This was 2016. Okay. It was the okay. summer of 2016. And, um... Ears just went bananas. And I was like, y'all, who is this kid? I was like, I got to interview him on the PM Effect. And so I just happened to be on the internet the following day. So that was like on a Saturday. The following day was a Sunday. I came across his photographer's page. I DM'd him and I was like, yo, I'm trying to interview Ears. Can you like connect me? He was like, here's the contact. So I reached out to management. They're like, we got set up a meeting. I'm like, a meeting? I ain't never had to set up no meeting for no interview. And mind you, by this time, I have interviewed DC on Fly, B. Simone, um, Ray Shrummer. Like, I'm interviewing people at this point, you know? So it's kind of like, what? An interview? Okay. So I, I ended up meeting with them. I ended up meeting with them, and um, we did a follow-up meeting the following day. The following day, it um, included another business partner of theirs, and it was like, yo, you remind me of a female version of us. Why don't you join our media team for eardrummers? I was like, bet. So mind you, this is like days before BET. Mind you, I just met these guys, but I'm just like, listen, I'm trying to get my foot in the door. Eardrummers trying to give me a chance. By this time, I said, fuck the interview. I didn't even get the interview at this point. I didn't even get the interview. But I knew they was leaving for L.A. on that Thursday. And I was like, yo. I'm like, dang, I want to ask them, can I go to L.A. with them? But how do I ask? I just met them. And I, something was just like, just ask. I was like, yo, can I go to L.A.? They was like, what you trying to go for? I was like, I'm trying to network. I'm trying to just... Um, meet new people or just get in doors that I've never been able to get in. And they was like, okay, cool. That Thursday morning, it was like 4 o'clock in the morning, and they booked me a flight for 8 o'clock that morning. So out of nowhere, I was in L.A. with eardrummers for the whole weekend kicking it. And mind you, I'm about like the only girl around besides their assistants at the time. And But nobody tried me the entire weekend. So I always commend them on that because it's very hard, first of all, trying to get your feet in the industry but also not only that getting people to respect you especially men because this is a 
female dominated industry. Mm -hmm. And so literally from that moment with me being able to go to LA and lying as I am, um, they told me I was eardrummers PR. So whenever I introduced myself, I'm Portia Marie, I'm eardrummers PR. I didn't know nothing about PR at that time. <laughs> and um, from that moment, when we was in radio room, so for those that don't know what radio room is, it's like a room like this, um, and it's like a desk, literally, side by side, just different radio stations um, sitting next to each other. And from the hottest artist to the the low artists, you know, the up and coming artists, I ain't gonna say low artists, but the up and coming artists mm -hmm. were in the room and I was walking around and at this time, Day Day was just getting hot. He was just buzzing in Atlanta and his manager stopped me and was like, yo, they was like, what do you do? I said, I'm Eardrummers PR. They was like, I'd like to work with you. When we get back to Atlanta, can we set up a meeting? I was like, bet. So about two, two or three or four weeks went by. Finally set up the meeting. Meeting went well. I still didn't get no work. I'm like, okay, what's up? And so finally I got my first task to go pick up tickets from DJ Holiday for a concert for Day Day. And then from that moment, that's when I actually started in the industry. I know it's a long story, but <laughs> no, it, it, it's, yeah, it, it was just crazy how God worked. And, um, and just to go back a few steps before that moment happened, I actually wasn't even supposed to be working block party. Technically, I wouldn't even been at block party, but I'm going to tell you what got me there. My internship coordinator at the time, she was a hater. I'm just going to say it like that. She was a hater. She was hating on me and the other interns, two of us, two beautiful ladies, just knowing how to work our move through the radio station and just knowing how to get our yeses outside of those no's that most people get. And I was supposed to work, actually, birthday bash, the big concert that night with, like, Future and Drake and all these other people, Gucci, whoever else that was performing that night. I was supposed to be working that night, but she hit me up days before and was like, oh, we're going to switch you to the block party instead. Mm. Okay, bet. <laughs> you know, me, sometimes I tell people, a lot of people like, man, you should have told her no, blah, blah, blah. I was like, no, it's okay. I was like, God is gonna work it out. And you know what? If out. I wasn't at the block party, I would never met, I would never been trying to interview ears. I would never met ear drummers. And I never would probably even have the experience that I have I've been able to witness um, as far as working with Day Day and even making my mark into the entertainment industry. So thank you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I guess it was because I was gonna bring it up, but so you were with Day Day right as he was coming up? Right. So when this was right before Spend It came out. Okay. So it was like, it was like in like right there. So literally what you mean was hot. Mm -hmm. Like it, it was hot at that time. Um, and so people knew of him. Well, this was the trick. Cause you know, you never really knew who he was. It was almost like you knew the song. So yeah. th at this point the song was big, but Spend It was just now coming out and you didn't know that it was him. Cause I didn't know it was him. Mm -hmm. I didn't know Spend It was his record until I started working with him. Yeah. And so um, it was like right when he started buzzing. Like he was hot when I came onto the team, but he had like just got hot, hot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I guess what was what was that whole process like of just because like you said, you came in early, so you were able to watch him go from minor buzz. Because yeah. I remember at the time, what was the song you had out before I spent it? He had another single out before, right? Oh yeah, what you mean? Yeah, what you yeah. mean? So I remember what you mean was like more of a local head at the time and spinning right. was the one that really took right. my life. So what did that look like being on the inside of an operation, watching the artist go from buzzing to like the, the hit, having a hit song? Um, well, like I said, he was, the song was hot at that time. So it was just dope to see him um, in his element. And not only that, it was just dope to see his transition from what you mean to spend it. Yeah. Because like I said, I didn't know spend it was his record until one day um, me and his manager was having a conversation and I said, he was like, yeah, we working this other record. I said, what record he got? He was like, you know, spend that shit. I was like, what? That's his record? Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah. I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> How you even with a team and didn't know this system? Well, because, you know, <laughs> the thing was it didn't sound like him. It, it, it sounded very, um, very distinctive from what you mean, yeah. you know, what you mean is more like a dance record and then it's coming with that spin that shit, it goes back kind of gangster. So I didn't, I wasn't expecting that, you know? Mm. So it was kind of like, shit, I didn't know that was him, yeah. you know? And it, it literally had just started buzzing on the radio, so. Okay, okay. So let's get into more more modern day. Um, 
So what what is your most of your day to day consist of doing now? What exactly are you doing within the industry now? So what I do now, I call myself a brand strategist entertainment strategist, even curator. So I basically work with different brands. Whatever I want to create, I create it with them. So from A3C, from Google, to Spinrilla, to K-Camp, to Rare Sounds, which is his label, um, to now Red Bull, which is coming up. Um, but basically, I create in my head what I would like to see, and then I try to attach myself to a brand that I think is um, replicable for my brand, mm -hmm. and which will make the most sense. Um, and I just create from there. So I do that, which most of the time it comes out to being an event, mm -hmm. um, from being a brand strategist to now being an event curator, uh, from one thought going to the next thought. Um, and then also day-to-day -day management for independent artists by the name of Oswald Cartier. Mm -hmm. And then also DJ Champ, who's also touring DJ with Lil Baby. You may all know him from his past from working with Gucci Mane. And he's now a producer. So that's like my day-to-day -day, um, operations for my company. Okay. So um, sticking with the brand strategy side. So you just said something that's interesting. You said you, you create the vision first and then you find a brand that it, it fits with the most? Yeah. For, for, the, for the most part, so my creative process is a little different. Um, I just create. And I don't, I don't create with um, instruction or like, oh, you got, it got to be like this. It got to be like that. No, I just create. And when I create, I'm like, okay, what makes the most sense? Or sometimes it might piggyback from me first thinking about a brand. I'm like, yo, I want to work with Red Bull. What can I do with Red Bull that would be dope mm -hmm. that I haven't seen them do or something they might have done, but I could add a twist to it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how my creative process go. Um, it might start with me thinking about the brand first and I'm like, what can I do that they haven't already done? Or I'll create something and I'll be like, well, shoot, I can reach out to Google and see if they will be interested in this. Mm. You know, so I don't I don't have any stipulations to how I create. I just create. So, you, so um, what was I about to ask? With, I guess, when you get the clients who come in with, let's say everyone gets those clients that come in and like, this is what I want. Like, this is my vision for it. Um, this is the kind of things that we, we see, want to see executed. I guess speaking for people who want to get into a similar position for you, how important would you say flexibility around ideas like that are? Um, you have to be flexible. To be honest, luckily, any brand that you have seen me work with over the past two years or so, I've been able to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, there hasn't been a brand that told me, no, that don't make sense. No, we can't do that. No, don't do that. Um, the only thing that might change is the budget. Mm -hmm. And you might have to, with that being said, then you have to compromise. Like, okay, instead of doing a step and repeat, maybe we do a backdrop on the projector or something like that. You know, a different way to save money. But it's never been an issue with me creating and the brand feeling like it doesn't make sense or fits their brand. Okay. Let's take it to more so, because a lot of people watching this, I, I'm sure there are some people that are watching this that are very interested in getting the same space that you are in. So let's say for the aspiring brand strategist or, you know, the person who's doing events in the community mm -hmm. that wants to be able to do events for the Red Bulls and the K-Camps mm -hmm. and those big brands, what advice would you give them to, to just start moving in that space? Um, you know, it's so weird, to be honest, to be in the space that I am in and to have the connections and relationships that I have with people. Um, because sometimes I don't think about what I'm doing. Uh, I don't even realize the relationships I have. And to be honest, as I sit here now and think about it, it's mind-blowing to know that I have a contact with Red Bull. I have a contact at Google. Mm -hmm. I have a contact at Spinrilla, SoundCloud, YouTube. Like, it's crazy to know that I have these relationships. But everything started with me first attending events and making myself be known. Anytime I introduce myself, hello, I'm Portia Marie. I never say Portia. Anybody in the world name can be Portia. Anybody can be Portia, but I'm Portia Marie. And I make sure people, people remember that. And then if you forget my name, because, you know, 
Everybody ain't the greatest with names. I ain't the greatest with names. But what I do is, when I feel like you forgot my name, I'll come and say, like, what's my name? What, what's my name? And you, Portia Marie. And then I'll leave and I'll come back. Hey, nice to meet you. What's your name again? What's my name? Like, you got to keep making people, you got to make people remember you. That's, that's another thing. You got to make people, don't be overbearing towards like, oh my gosh, get, the, get out of my face. But you have to make people remember you and you got to stick to what it is. Don't feel like, oh, I don't want to say my first and middle name because people don't think I'm bougie or I'm too much. No, that's your name. I ain't made Portia Maria. That's my name. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like if somebody feel indifferent about that, so what? But that's my name. <laughs> so I respectable persistence. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. And that's all it is. And so I just say get out there, be a part, be kind, be nice to people, speak, you know. Everybody, you know, I know some people are socially awkward, but just say, hey, you don't even have to say too much. You don't have to hold a whole conversation. Just be like, hey, how you doing? I'm Portia. Nice to meet you. What you do? Oh, I'll bet I do this. And then you just figure out ways to connect with each other. That's how a lot of my relationships build. I mean, one person, I tell them what I do. They tell me what they do. I may be able to connect them to somebody. They may be able to connect me to somebody else. And then that's how the circle just keep, like, building. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So. so okay, so I'm glad you said that. Because what I was going to bring up was um, what me and just some of the other people we mutually know I always talk about you is that it seems like a lot of the people you do business with, you're actually like friends with them on a, on, yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. That's, uh, now, that's important. A lot of people, especially in the industry, People, people funny acting. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people are funny acting. Some people will just socialize with you just for business, but a lot of people would rather have that relationship with you to the point where they can trust you. Because a lot of people don't like to give out their contacts to YouTube or their contacts to Google or whoever because there's like, listen, my name is now on the line. Mm -hmm. And if you go mess up my relationship, then it falls back on me. So it's very important to um, build relationships with people. Um, you don't, every time you hit them up, and don't have to always be about business you don't always have to um hit people up you know like oh um who what project you working on next but like what book are you reading or yeah. you want to go grab something to eat or um oh that hair color look nice like who did your color girl like whatever like just um try to figure out ways to build relationships outside of just business because it becomes very overwhelming um, because you got to understand people are still human mm -hmm. and um, people are still human. They get tired of just doing business all the time. Yeah. So you, you guys sometimes treat relation like relationships, even though you just met them, like they're your friends or family versus business partner. Yeah. Like you said, like you said, everyone isn't trying to talk about business. No. Especially, especially I, I feel like especially here in Atlanta where, it feels like 80% of the people here are doing business stuff or industry stuff. It's yes. like, dang, bro, I just got done with eight calls yes. a day. Yes. Let's go get lunch. And, yes. Yeah. I feel let's it. go get ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so let's let's move it into a little bit of a different space. Because like you were saying earlier, um, a lot of your day-to-day -day is more brand strategy for uh, some of these major corporations. But then you also step back and you do a lot of day-to-day -day brand strategy for your artist, Oswald Cartier. Yes. And uh, your <laughs> DJ, right? So d do you notice, is it similar trying to build the brand up of a corporation versus the building the brand up of an artist? Like, are there things that you that you take away from brand building for companies that you apply to brand building for your artists? Um... That's, uh, that's a good question. Actually, I don't think... So when it comes to cre the creative side of things, I just create, period. Mm. So when it comes to my artists and when it comes to a corporation, I just create. Mm. Um, and like I said, I don't do anything with stipulations. It don't matter if it's corporate America or if it's like urban. I still just create. And then I'll, tell, I'll allow you to tell me when I have to dumb it down. But other than that, I'm going to be as big and as broad and as crazy and outrageous as I want to be until you tell me I have to dumb me down. So in retrospect, I, I guess it's kind of like one in the same. I, I treat them both equally the same uh, from my artist to if I was going to take the same idea to a brand, to be honest. Mm, okay. Yeah. So it, it goes back to that kind of like creating the idea and then just it yeah, the, the, the thing is, this is the trick. Don't be scared to um, create as big as you want because it's Coca-Cola. 
and like, oh my gosh, I don't want to say this to Coca-Cola. Like, no, say it to Coca-Cola and see what Coca-Cola say. And then if they don't like it, then let them um, dumb it down for you, but don't you dumb yourself down, mm -hmm. you know? So I just say always be as big as you want to be, be as creative as you want to be. Um, of course, be respectful to the brand, but don't like dumb it down because, oh my gosh, it's Coca-Cola. Or, you know, treat Coca-Cola like it's, um, like it's Cartoon Network or whatever, or Adult Swim. Like, treat it all the same, um, you know? So, I just always say create big. So, with with them, with the artists who, I'm, I'm not trying to count their pockets, but I, I'm going to assume that on a, on a majority of the time basis, they don't have the same budgets that, like, YouTube or A3C would have. So Agreed. How are you, how are you able to, um, or how are you, you and him, because I'm assuming it's a partnership in uh -huh. that, able to kind of like do those big ideas or think big within a, a, a rising artist budget? Um, okay, so independent artists, they don't be having no money like that. I'm just yeah. being real. They don't. <laughs> they be penny pension for real. But I will say, ain't nothing wrong with that. You got to learn how to use your creative ability and your budget to make it make sense for you. Mm -hmm. So, with that being said, for example, my artist, I saw Cartier, um, last year around November, December, I did a whole parade on Edgewood. It's a guerrilla style parade on Edgewood with less than, I pulled that off with less than um, $150 or $200, I think. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, let me let me let me think. Cause U-Haul, they try to play me. So at first it's supposed to be like a hundred dollar U-Haul, but I ended up getting it for like twenty-five dollars or something. And then the little shingles or whatever was like fifteen dollars or something on Amazon. And the generator. And the generator was yeah. like twenty dollars or something. The DJ was free. She had her own speaker. Um, the dancers was free. They were my friends, cousins, um, <laughs> randoms. They came out of nowhere, did it for free. Um, they had their own outfit. Um, the band, they ended up, I just treated everybody to pizza. I probably spent like $150, $200. And we did a whole parade on Edgewood. And it's nothing you could take away from that moment because I didn't have no permit. Everybody flaked on me that Friday. We did this parade on a Monday. Everybody flaked on me that Friday. So I had to research on Instagram, find me a band. Just happened I came across this drummer, and he just happened to have, like, six other pieces to the band that I needed. Mm -hmm. And then I just hit up my cousin. She was like, I'll take off from work. I hit up my little sister. She said, Ben, I'll come. And then my homegirl just had two other dancers that I never even knew. They never rehearsed a day in their life together besides an hour before. I came up with the routine. Um, like, it was crazy. The U-Haul, literally that day, we didn't get the U-Haul until 5 o'clock. And the parade started at 7 o'clock. And we were supposed to have it by 9 o'clock that morning. They sent us to four different U-Hauls. So... It be like crazy stuff like that. You be going through so much and you'll panic. I'm like, oh my gosh, just forget this. We ain't gonna do this. But it worked out and got in our favor, you know, because I was persistent. I wasn't tripping because money wasn't an issue because it wasn't $150, $200. Yeah. And, you know, people think you got to have a thousand plus dollars to put on a parade. But we just went out there and did our thing and we had so much fun. And what I did, I just treated everybody to pizza. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, treat them to pizza, feed people. Like, that always, that always works. So, um, like, working with that type of budget, like, we didn't have no budget. Mm. But we made a whole parade go on with just $150 to $200. Now, granted, if I would have had, like, a Red Bull plug or something, I could have did a lot more. Yeah. But I did what I could with what I had. And so, don't let the budget scare you either because you can be as creative as you want to be. You just got to have the right people around you. Yeah, somebody told me once that... Um Budget is always an excuse for lack of creativity. It is. Yeah. It is. That's a fact. <laughs> that is a fact. Because I do whatever I want to do with zero budget. <laughs> zero dollars. We doing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, staying on the staying on the, the artist side, or actually, no, I, I kind of want to go for that. Because when you first brought up to us that you were starting to manage a DJ, the first thing... I thought was, hmm, what is that like? Like, what is is it different between managing an artist 
day to day and managing a DJ day to day, or is it all? Is it all just like they're they're personalizing them day, so it's kind of the same? Um. See, both of both of my clients are really chill. Thank the Lord, they're real chill. But it is a lot easy. Well. I don't even necessarily say it's easier to manage a DJ. It can, it can be. Mm. Um, see, with him, my DJ, he's always booked because he's always on the road with a little baby. But I'm trying to work on things like in 2020 to get him like a residency in like Miami or something like that. Uh, something that can bring in uh, more money. Mm. On the side, just because, um, but sometimes it's hard to book him for things because, like I say, he is on the road and it's just like ongoing, it's nonstop. The trick to it now is that he's a producer, so now I need to make it my initiative, make it an initiative to remind people that okay, I also manage a producer mm. outside of just him being a DJ. Mm. So it's like now you gotta, you need to work overtime so you can help it bring in more money so you can get the bit placements like everybody else and have the celebration plaques and stuff like everybody else gets to do on Instagram. So it is, it's technically easier to manage a DJ, but then again, it's not as easy um, if they don't have a successful artist that they're DJing for, yeah. it, then you have to go out and really try to find bookings for them so they can have money to survive every month, you know? Well, that's, that's why I asked because I was looking at like managing the DJ where it's more service based and that you, yeah. you can get them booked for a gig a lot faster than you can get a yeah. smaller artist a paid but, show. Right, now, now that is true. Now it's way much easier to get a, a DJ book before an artist, an uh, up and coming artist because like I said, it's easier. Like you said, it's, it's a service. So, But then you might have a bougie DJ to where, you know, they might not want to be booked like that like because my dj like i have to be very strategic about it too because he don't want to be anywhere consistent like you know that he gonna be here every friday mm -hmm. he don't want nothing like that so it's like you gotta do strategic type of bookings well, how you gonna get him a residency then if he doesn't well <laughs> i guess if it's not I, well i guess more so say if it's not in atlanta okay, it's okay. a little different okay, okay yeah so that's why i was like let me try you know go out the market to like miami LA or something like that, then it'll be different because it's like, oh, you ain't got to worry about people in Atlanta pulling up on him, you know, type of thing. Does that help? Like, does does the fact that he's Lil Baby's DJ, like, have you seen that translate over to making it easier to move him in producer spaces? Um, well, I think for himself, like, he has had relationships with people with these artists for years, okay. even before now. So it's easier for him to be able to send over a B pack to an artist um, versus me having to, like, figure out like oh who's their a and r because he already had the relationship yeah so it makes it so that's why i say it, it depends on who you're working with that makes it easier too because when you're working with somebody like him that already had relationships with these artists before they even blew up mm. and stuff like that it's just kind of like oh that's my homeboy i'm just about to send him a beat pack and he gonna send it send it back to me yeah, back to the relationship yeah back to the relationships okay okay um so moving back to the brand strategy stuff because like I said, I'm sure there are people who are watching this. I know there's a couple people that reach out to me that do events and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the big thing that always comes up is everyone wants the sponsor for their event. Like everyone wants to be able to put an event together and say like, oh, cool. I had Red Bull there. Yeah. I had X and Y there. So are there any are there any actionable steps that someone with a solid event reputation could start doing today to, to start reaching out to sponsors? Like, what, what advice would you give to someone who wants to get people like that on their stuff? Um, well, I would say this. Where you see these sponsors at, like, if you see other events going on and you see that they're sponsored or powered by these brands, go to the events and try to meet the person. Mm. Um, that's the first step, like... How I um, built a relationship with my Google Connect. Actually, my homeboy, a close friend of mine, actually, he had his um, event with Google first. And then, I actually, I didn't get to make it to his event because we had an event that same day. I'm like, dang, I'm not going to be able to meet the dude from Google. So then someone else ended up having an event with Google. And I just went to the event 
found who I need to speak with. Actually, I reckon I recognized who he was on Instagram first. Mm-hmm. So when I saw him in person, I know exactly who I need to speak with. And so when I saw him in person, I just knew what exactly to say. Like, you need to have a plan, too. A lot of people, y'all go to people, and you don't even have a plan. And then that automatically kind of makes the conversation go left because you don't even know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You don't even know what you want. And a lot of times what I do, I already have a deck created for what I want. So, but therefore, you can't even tell me no. So, my very first event, um, I already had the deck created. And I just said... What's a deck for people that don't know? uh, So, a a sponsorship deck is basically... And I'm going to try to simplify it. It's like a slideshow that details step by step what the event is, when, why, where. And it's just basically telling the person why, why you want to do the event, why they should be a part of the event, when will the event be, who will it cater to, what can you bring to the table, what would they get out of the sponsorship, and things of that nature. So that's to dumb it down for those that may not know what, what it is. But it's literally like creating a slideshow or a presentation to tell somebody why they should come to this event and why is it important to you and how it can benefit them in the long run. Hmm. So like a blueprint pretty much telling them like this is why it'll be beneficial. Yeah, this is why it's beneficial for you to be a part of this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, and uh, that's what I do. I just create, I create decks and I present them to people. But I will go to those events with people who I want to connect with or brand that I want to connect with or whatever. And, and, and really, before even that, you should start writing stuff down. Like, in the top of the year, I was writing down different brands or people or creatives or whoever I want to work with, and I manifest those things. Because, like, my Red Bull plug... It came out of nowhere, mm. literally out of nowhere. But I manifested this early last year, and I was able to build a relationship late last year. And so now, early this year, I'm able to create an, uh, an event with them. So um, I say first, the first step is, like, you just need to get out there and go to the events where you see the sponsors and figure out who to talk to. Ask questions. Ask anybody. Ask the doorman. Ask the secretary at the front desk, you know who so-and-so is? Like, more likely they had to introduce themselves when they first entered that building. So those are the type of people you need to be paying attention to. The people you overlook, the people you need to be paying attention to. Have you ever made a sponsorship connection just through cold reaching out through social media or anything? Um, or just through any cold reach out process? Like, has it, has it always been you had a... It was for I I feel like for some reason I was just been a relationship, mm. and just so happened like a lot of times my friends ended up in positions. Like mm. a lot of the times these people didn't have these positions when I first met them. They probably was somewhere else doing something totally different. And then when the opportunity presented itself for them to be in a higher uh, in a higher up position, it even opened up doors for me to have a connection inside. Um, a connection inside their company at that time for me to expand and grow. So um, sometimes I, I think a lot of it just came from my relationships, and then I just looked up to have dope friends that ended up doing dope shit. So yeah, it's it's cool that you say that because I remember, like I feel like everyone when they first try to get in the industry, we always try to reach out to people who are bigger than us, right? And they always say the same thing. They always like. Deal with your peers and, yep. and shit will work out. And then at first you're like, what, what are you talking about? My friend works at like FedEx. Like, what are you talking right. about? But then in two years, your friend that wanted to be a DJ has been grinded in two years. Now they're a DJ for a bigger artist and that exactly. can help you put into those positions. So would you, for someone that wants to get into this same space, would you, would you advise them to put more of their energy into relationship building and maintenance or more into the like, creative, like, creative, uh, refining their creative uh, approach to the way they put things together? Um, they kind of can do both. You definitely want to build the relationships, but also when you're doing a good job at something, people going to start to recognize you. Mm. Um, so, we, like, dope people meet. When I created dope people meet, so many people underestimated me, didn't open up their doors for me, wouldn't do nothing. When my mentor, Jason Reddy, opened up his doors to me at, at, at the ASCAP office, that's all I needed. Mm-hmm. Just give me a chance to see 
just give me a chance to either succeed or fail on my own. But I don't need you to tell me that I'm going to fail. Let me figure it out. You get what I'm saying? So the thing is, for me, I just feel like it's better when you can just create and allow yourself to fail if you're going to fail. But by the grace of God, I've just been able to go up and up from dope people meet. A lot of people that I have relationships with now and people that are trying to do stuff for me on the back end and things of that nature came from them seeing the work. Mm -hmm. It didn't come from a relationship or anything. It was just like, yo, I saw what you did. That was dope. Like, I, oh, my gosh, this was the best panel we came to at A3C. Like, oh, my gosh, this, this, and that. Your work speaks for itself. So outside of just building relationships, you also need to have a unique platform or brand, whatever it is that you're building, for um that people can respect and grow with with you, you know, as you're still building it. Because, like, right now, I don't know the answer to everything. Like, people, mm -hmm. I tell my team that all the time. Like, just because on the outside looking in, y'all think, oh, my gosh, it's so great. Everything is this and everything is that. Y'all don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Y'all don't really know. Y'all let y'all see what y'all want to see. Y'all know what y'all want to know. From, work to make stuff yeah. look easy. Yeah, we just <laughs> we just make you believe what you want to believe, but it would be so much more to it than you could you could see, mm -hmm. you know. And so um, I think it's just a good thing to do both. Like I said, just build the build the relationship, but also be dope at what you do too. Because just because you have a relationship, don't mean you gonna have the opportunity to create and build with that person either. Like mm -hmm. then I'm just because it's your friend, don't mean she fl just follow through all the time either. That's not a rule. Yeah, I, tr I try to take the approach that. Cause I have friends that are, for lack of better terms, are like bigger positions than I'm in the industry. I have friends that are like, for lack of better terms, like in lower positions mm -hmm. than I'm in the industry. And I've always just looked at it like, just wait. Like if it's meant to happen, we'll work it's together. It's gonna happen if regardless. Not, I still support yep. you over there doing your yep. thing. You know what I'm saying? And hopefully it works out. So let's let's pivot into um, dope people meet. So what exactly is dope people meet for those who don't know? Dope people meet is where creators meet. <laughs> But no, seriously, um, Dope People Meet is where creators meet. Dope People Meet is an event curation platform where we create dope events on a monthly basis, is working with the different brands, the different entities within the community around us and beyond. We are working on a national scale right now where we're doing these mini pop-up tours. Um, that's why I call it. So it's like a mini pop-up tour going on. We started in New York in November and in February we are going to Charlotte and then we might be going to LA and then we might be going to Toronto and then we might be going to you never know <laughs> so um but it's, it's definitely a a space where creators meet and this like seriously it you come to a dope people meet event you're guaranteed to meet another creative another dope creative from a, an exec that you wish you could meet or somebody you was like, I would never get to meet them. I never get to touch them or artists. You, I love him. I adore his music. You actually get to touch them, talk to them. Um, like I literally create these environments for you to meet people that you feel like you can physically touch or speak to. And, but I put them right in the palm of your hands for free. Mm. Nine times out of 10, we have free events all the time. You're getting to meet these people for free, for yeah. free. Which is always important, right? It goes back to like the whole concept of like, in order for you to really move, you gotta be around people who are at least mildly trying to take it serious. No, for real. Yeah, I feel like that's a, that's a big part of it. So sticking with dope people meet, cause I was there, like I watched dope people meet go from the, the room in the ASCA office to some of the, the things that you are doing now. So what have been what have been the bigger lessons that you've learned from building building stuff? So, it's been more like two years in the making now? Going on two years in the making? Going on two years in June. In June it will be two years. Mm -hmm. Um what's the question? What are some things that you've learned from starting it then to getting it to where it is now? Um the biggest lesson Wow. I have one that might be because I remember the argument you was having with Jason that night, but I don't know if that's what you Tell were me. When he was telling you to calm down, be patient, and just that shit ain't going to work, but do it again and figure it out. And I was like, man, that's a pretty, I don't know if you don't want to hear it, but that's a pretty solid lesson, I feel like, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so the biggest lesson is understanding 
you do have to learn how to be patient. Mm. Um, especially when you're working with a team of people that you're not paying. Mm -hmm. Not because you don't want to pay them. It's just because it's a brand new baby and you just don't have the funds to do so. Like the only funds that are that you may have is just to execute the event and that's it. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember to respect people's time and be patient with people when they're still trying to learn you. Mm -hmm. Because everybody don't know how to operate and, and maneuver around certain people. And me, I'm not the easiest person to work with, but I'm not the hardest person to work with either. I'm just very direct. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm trying to get in a space where I also try to, like, everybody know I'm very blunt. But I try to also be careful with my words because I don't want to offend anybody that is giving their time to me, mm -hmm. especially when I'm not paying them. Mm -hmm. um, but... By the grace of God, I can say anybody that has worked with me over the past year, those that I wasn't able to pay in the very beginning months or a year or whatever, however long it was, I have been able to pay every single person on my team at some point in time. So I'm, I feel very proud about that because they don't understand. Like People think that people always want to just get free work, free work. Yes, free work is great. However, a lot of me want to pay my team like this so i would i always say somebody's going to walk inside of one of my events one day and is going to pay and place a million dollar check on the table and say here and walk away and not going to say nothing to me and that's the day i can literally take my team away from the nine to fives because it's hard to maneuver with people where, you know, you got to consider the fact that they work in these nine to fives, they're tired as fuck, and then they got to deal with your mouth too. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it can become draining. So I've always had a goal since I started was to take away, take my team away from the nine to fives. And so, so for me, I think over the course of the year is trying to learn patience. But also, one thing my grandmother taught me, one thing my grandmother always used to say, don't ever beg nobody for anything mm -hmm. so one thing about me you come around me and you act like for a second you want to leave i'm going to let you leave no matter how much i love you care for you i will let you leave mm -hmm. i will not beg you to stay around my team my company because i'm very protective of energies I, i'm i i'm very particular about what energies we let in and around the space that i create in so um patience patience yeah is a key always so so how do you how do you convince um people and by people i mean sometimes me to work <laughs> for you for free and because these events take a lot of work like like i said being being at some of these events also working them for free i'll see and watch them from around like it's a it's a shit ton of work so what are you doing to convince them and us to continue doing this stuff before free because that's one thing a lot of people reach out like we tell my like, team building is so important you can't execute these ideas yourself then like i don't have any money to pay somebody this videographer wants 200 dollars. this right marketer wants two racks like how how do you, how are you convincing people or making it worth it for people to work for you for free it's energy for some god-given reason people gravitate to me on one way or another um, out of nowhere, like before this team I have now, I had a dope team before them, and there were some young students in college. They were, um, they was very, they were some go getters. I love them, I love them so much. But it got to a point where some of them became seniors in college, and they were trying to graduate. And it's like, Porsche, everything you asking me to do, I can't really do, and focus on my work at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I ended up losing some people. But I still, like I said, you let people go, let them do what they got to do. And then out of nowhere, see, one thing about it, I never reach out to people. Um, nine times out of ten, I'm not going to reach out to you. I'll let you reach out to me because when you reach out to me, you're more invested than when I reach out to you. Right. Because it's like I'm trying to make you do something that you may or may not want to do at that time. But if you come to me, it's more likely something you're more interested in and something you're more willing to give your efforts and energy to. Mm -hmm. So um, honestly, it just so happened randomly how my teams even formed. Like my team now, I made Sam, which is my business partner, or I call the COO of the company, 
um, the chief operating officer, for those that may not know who that is. Um, but Sam, I actually, before I started Dope People Me, I was trying to figure out me as a brand, Portia Marie. And I was like, yo, you should manage me because he was able to... He was able to tell me about myself and I was receptive to it. So I'm not very receptive to everybody. But one thing about Sam, I was able to be receptive to the things he was saying. So it started off with him supposedly managing me. Mm -hmm. And then he come and have a friend named Ja'Cory that do... I'm mean, uh, getting the government out, bro. Don't be getting the government out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> what do people know you by? We in the now, but it's, it's Corey, bro. You out here throwing the government out of it. What you want me to say on here? No, it's cool. You don't already said it. Keep going. Goodness <laughs> gracious. So then I meet Mr. I was going to call you your last day. <laughs> so then I meet Ja'Cory, who um, do playlisting and things of that nature. I'm like, okay, that's dope. That's somebody cool to know because, shoot, I got an independent artist. Mm -hmm. I bet. Then comes... Glenn, who emails me, who's an accountant, but wants to work with us. And I'm just like, okay, we don't need no accountant right now. Because like I said, the money went flowing like that. It'll be, need somebody to count our dollars. Like, I can count them two or three dollars. But we have an accountant. And Sam thinking, oh, he's overqualified. I'm like, no, he's not. Because the people me is a multi-million dollar company. We may not have the millions in the bank right now, but we're going to have it, and we're going to need somebody to count that at, once, at some point. Mm -hmm. So I bring Glenn on board. and But he also mentions that he's into artist management. Okay, I have an artist. I can't always be everywhere all the time because I have a busy schedule too. Mm -hmm. Come help me manage my artist. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Bet. Then I come and I had Morgan, who ended up becoming like an assistant, like a day-to-day -day person to me. They have Queen, who loves to do events. So she's helping with the logistics of the event. Then we have Reagan, who just wants to intern. Um, she's really into modeling and things of that nature, but then she comes on and almost like an assistant too, and learning how to do social media marketing and learning how to do influencer marketing and things of that nature. So just slowly but surely, like, the team formed itself, and I didn't have to force it. It was just kind of like one of those things. I put everybody in the room one day. I was like, well, hey, y'all, this the group chat. Uh, hey, y'all, let's meet. Hey, y'all, let's talk about the next event. And then just from nothing came everything mm -hmm. to me. Um, everything came. Like, some of those people are, may not be with us now, but... The team's still solid. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I still don't lack. I don't feel like I'm without or anything. I feel like still with some people that are not um, a part anymore, I still feel like we're solid. Mm -hmm. I still feel like we're solid. My cousin, whenever, you know, I need her to step in, she'll step in. So at the end of the day, I always have a team around me. So it's not the easiest thing, but I will always say let people gravitate to you, gravitate to you. Um, versus you go looking for them, and then they'll respect you a little bit more. And when you say, hey, I don't got no money to pay you, but I'll feed you, people will respect that. Because, like, okay, she didn't just say, forget us. Mm -hmm. She at least, like, put some gas in my car, or maybe she fed us mm -hmm. some pizza. You know, it's not probably going to, you know, last you for 10 hours to have you full for 10 hours. But it's like, okay, she cares enough to do something for me. And it's enough enough outside value because we talk about it as like if you want people to work for you for free or really little you have to be bringing them value to something that they want to do right like it, has to, it has to make sense it has to click in their mind and make sense for them to go like okay yeah she can't pay me i am doing 20 hours worth a week but she's putting me in positions to talk to x people or she's put me in a right. room a room that i may not normally have went to if i wasn't working these things so i think a lot of that is important because i even look at some of our operations like a lot of people that are working with me, I always ask them first, like, what do you want out of the situation? Like, what do you feel like you're going to get from doing this, mm -hmm. doing this with us? And if, if it's something that I know I feel like realistically can come from it, then it's like, right, cool, I can make that happen for you. Then if like, it's not, then just give me a number, man. I'll figure out if I can pay you or not. Like, yeah. No, yeah, no, that's, <laughs> but that is real. But I, and that, I'm glad you brought that up. That is another point to, um, to our operations is that I am, connecting them and putting them in rooms to meet people that they wish for themselves that they could meet someday. 
and may actually build a relationship with and be real cool with them. Mm-hmm. And they'll just be like, dang, that's cake count right there. And he just cool as fuck. Like, yeah. you know, just be little stuff like that where people be like, dang, like, I wouldn't be here. Or, you know, because I don't look at all this stuff be like, oh, my gosh, so-and-so in the room. I'm like... Okay, and I've been around so many people, like, it is what it is, but to somebody else that's working with me or, you know, they be like, yo, this is amazing. Like, oh, my gosh, thank you so much. So, you know, people be very grateful for the, you know, the environments I'm able to even put them in, for real, so. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, I guess, what's next? What do you have coming up? Is there anything particular that... That you want to plug or push push people? You know, we have a very cool audience, man. Yeah. Go check it out. Guys, yeah. so <laughs> I will be hosting my very first webinar, the PM webinar, How to Build Sponsorship Decks. Okay. So many people try to figure out what's the step to get a sponsor on board? How do I talk to them? What do you put in there? What is this? What is that? What is that blueprint you're talking about? This is the chance to get to learn how to create a sponsorship deck that is significant enough to attract a potential sponsor. And and let me say this too. Don't always think just because every time I pitch, I get sponsors. Sponsors are not that easy to get. It don't just come as easy as people think they do. So it's not like... Oh, create the sponsorship deck, and tomorrow, yes, I got Red Bull. Yes, I got Sprite. I got Coca-Cola. It don't work like that. But this is a great starting point to learn how to even get the attention of a potential sponsor. And then the following month, I will be teaching you how to pitch to the sponsor after you have the sponsorship deck created. And also, on February 8th, we are doing Dope People Meet the Carolinas. A conversation with Arnold Taylor and King Carter, which is home of the Baby South Coast Music Group in Charlotte, North Carolina. So you guys, please stay tuned for that. Follow me at Portia Marie, P-O-R-C-H-I-A, M-A-R-I-E, <laughs> for ticket sales, you know. The Corey said I'm too early, but... Get your tickets yeah, now man, because seats are filling up. like my lead out question was like, you know, tell them where to find you in there. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you go. So all the socials, dope people meet at dope people meet at Portion Marie. Yes, at, at dope people meet at dope people meet at the PM firm at Portion Marie. Follow all of our brands and companies and help keep making us great. Okay, okay. Um, did you have any final thoughts? Any, any last pieces of wisdom you want to give? I will say, in all that you do and whatever you want to do, do it. Don't let anything or anyone, no amount of money or anything, discourage you from doing you. Do whatever you want to do. I don't care the matter of any circumstance. Like, I've had zero dollars in my account on so many occasions that it never discouraged me. I always felt like I had a million dollars when I had zero dollars in my account. Don't ever let a dollar amount, don't ever let any words from anybody that's not doing what you're doing discourage you from doing anything. Do what you want to do. Dream as big as you want to and just be prosperous and manifest everything you ever want to do in life. I read those are, those are some dope words. Mm-hmm. Um, well, thank you again, Portia. Thank you for joining us. Thank uh, you for having it's me. It's been a long time in the making. Um, other than that, if you feel like you learned anything, please like and share this video. Hit those post notifications as well as I wouldn't want you guys to miss anything. Once again, I am Corey. This has been my guest, Porsche Marie, and I will see y'all next time. Thank you, guys.